Today I'm going to I'm, I'm going to be talking about a, a bunch of different papers. Actually, um, the title of the talk is "The Changing Structure of Africa's Economies." Um, the work I'm going to talk uh, about today is um, joint work with a bunch of um, different people. One of them, Ken Hartgen, is here in the front row. Um, Danny Roderick, um, Inigo Verduzco, and Sebastian Vollmer. Um, and I'd like to thank DFID and ESRC for, and uh, the African Development Bank for financial support for this work. So um, first I want to talk about uh, motivation for the research, then some recent evidence on structural change in Africa. Everything I'm going to talk about today is, is, is Africa-based. Uh, all the data are Africa-only data, but um, could be extended to other countries and regions. Um, then I'm going to talk about s some recent work that I'm doing with Ken and Sebastian on um, structural change using the DHS data, dem demographic and health survey data, and then summary and directions for work. Um, so the motivation for this work is um, the fact we all know that Africa has been growing relatively rapidly over the past decade or decade and a half, and what we, what we are less um, aware of is what, what exactly has been driving this growth. Is it high commodity prices? Is it structural change? Is it something else? So this graph, um, <clears throat> what, you what you should pay attention to are just the red, green, and blue uh, solid lines. These are um, commodity prices for African countries. Um, <clears throat> it's a GDP weighted average. And um, what you can see is in 2000, commodity prices started to skyrocket. So there's a lot of speculation that Africa's recent growth is based on commodity prices. Um, alternatively, um, there's, there's, a, there's the possibility that um, Africa's growth has actually been based on structural change. So what I have up here are, um, the, there are three different panels, agriculture, industry, and services. Um, the, the original graphs are from a paper that was published in the uh, QJE by Duarte, Margarita Duarte and Diego Restuccia uh, in 2010. And they look at structural change, causes and consequences, and um, implications of structural change in a cross-section of countries. However, their data set includes no African countries. So the innovation here is that we superimposed our data from Africa on the graphs. I can ask a very quick question. Sure. What is the, the vertical axis? Oh, it's the share uh, yeah. of uh, agriculture in the total labor force or the share of agriculture uh, in total employment? Share of agriculture in total employment. Okay. And, um, right, so, and, and across the horizontal axis, we have log GDP per capita. So the red dots are Africa, and the blue dots are the data from um, Diego, uh, um, oh, sorry. Duarte and Restuccia. So it's interest, these, I think these graphs are interesting for two reasons. First of all, they suggest that, uh, this is tangential to what I'm going to be talking about today, but they suggest that Africa doesn't really look very different from the rest of the world given its current, le you know, its levels of GDP per capita in 1990. In other words, shares of employment and agriculture are very high in Africa, but income per capita is also very low in Africa. So it's what we would expect given income levels in Africa. Likewise for industry, likewise for services. But, um, but the important point um, as, as regards structural change is that in Africa, most of the countries still have extraordinarily high shares of um, employment in agriculture. Um, if we believe that productivity and output and consumption are lower in agriculture than they might be in industry or services, then there's huge scope for growth based on a movement of em employment out of agriculture and into other sectors of the economy. So why should you care? Um, well, understanding what's driving Africa's growth is important for understanding both the sustainability of the recent growth, uh, in other words, if it's just high commodity prices, will the growth slow down once commodity prices fall again? And also the likely distributional implications of um, the, re the recent growth. Um, if there is significant structural change, then and, in other words, if we do see workers moving out of agriculture and into other sectors of the, the economies of these countries, then the likelihood is that, um, the, is that incomes are rising for some of the poorest people in these countries. Um, so, um, and 
in a paper I, I wrote with Danny Roderick in 2011, we found that structural change in Africa for the period 1990 to 2005 had actually been growth reducing. In other words, there were actually people moving out of industry and back into agriculture. I, I would like to take this opportunity <laughs> to update you on those results because the update is very important. So it turns out that when you, um, when you, break, when you extend the sample to 2010, and actually I see my, my colleague from the IMF in the, um, in the audience, and, um, and um, he was very uh, instrumental in helping me get the data to update these results, so I'd like to thank him. Um, but the um, left-hand side of the panel and the right-hand side of the panel are two different decades. And um, what, I did, what I did is um, still focus on only the countries in the Roderick and McMillan sample, but break out the, um, the, the, the data into two periods. And I, I guess I lied because this includes not just Africa. But um, what I have is um, the blue line is within sector productivity growth, and the red line is the productivity growth. The red bar is the productivity growth that comes from moving, say, out of agriculture and into manufacturing, where the marginal productivity of labor is higher. So, 1990 to 1999, you see Africa where um, actually if you, if you take the average of the two for that decade, the overall growth was slightly negative. Overall growth in GDP per capita was slightly negative. Um, and, but, but the mo more important and uh, more puzzling thing is that structural change contributed negatively to growth in Africa during that period. However, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, you see that between 2000 and 2010, there was positive structural change in Africa, and almost half of the growth in Africa during that decade was a result of structural change. In other words, labor moving from low productivity activities to relatively higher productivity activities. So why the change? Why the big change? I have a detailed um, paper addressing these issues, but just to give you um, a sense, during the 1990s, many countries were still going through the throes of structural adjustment. There's a paper by James Thurlow and um, Wobst, I don't remember his first name, but that, that talks about Zambia, for example, where the dismantling of the copper sector and um, the structural adjustment programs put into place led to deindustrialization and workers moving out of the city back to the countryside. But that process, um, was more or less completed by the end of the 1990s. And in the 2000s, we see a renewed commitment to agriculture and increasing agricultural productivity. Um, you, you, you are all probably aware of CADEP, the Common African Agricultural Development Prog um, Program. Uh, demographic trends, rural population growth slowing down, um, and political change. There's been a lot of political change, um, not necessarily democracy as we know it, but much more um, uh, expression of what people want um, to their governments. Um, so, but, but, um, but these country averages, the, the, I mean, sorry, this, this continent-wide average hides significant country-specific heterogeneity. Um, so, um, for example, we have Mauritius here, which is um, a diversified economy. This is showing that in Mauritius, between the, the dates are up, up top, 2000 and 2007, there were big changes in the economy of Mauritius, but the changes in, in Mauritius were not characteristic of the changes in the rest of Africa. The changes in Mauritius, you saw, um, excuse me, uh, the size of the circle represents the size of the sector in the economy, and in Mauritius, they have a, a large manufacturing sector. That's much different from most other African countries. And there was, a, there was a large employment in manufacturing fell by six percentage points, while employment in agriculture fell by around one and a half percentage points. There was a huge increase in the share of employment in the services sector, and that sector is large. And also, what the vertical, what the vertical axis shows is that productivity in the services sector is much higher in Mauritius than it is in manufacturing and agriculture. Why is that? That's because the services that Mauritius uh, people engage in are tend to be high tech and um, technolo sorry technology intensive and human capital intensive. Sorry, 
Um, on the other hand, we have countries like Nigeria that's um, heavily resource dependent. If you look along the horizontal axis, the changes in employment shares are minuscule. There's been some shift out of agriculture into manufacturing, but these are, these are small. Um, the, the majority of the people still work in the agricultural sector. Uh, Uganda, the Ugandan economy, this is, um, by the way, the titles are, they probably remind you of the, those, those categories used by McKinsey and Company when they did the, the Emerging um, Africa report, and um, they're roughly similar. So in Uganda, you actually see pretty substantial structural change. And even if you go back, you see this. So you see a large movement out of, out of agriculture, primarily into um, services, but, but also into manufacturing. Malawi, what we call a pre-transition economy, the majority of the labor force still in agriculture, very small changes in Malawi. So summarizing the results from the macro data, roughly half of Africa's recent growth can be attributed to structural change. But um, the expansion in services uh, is only sustainable for most countries if commodity prices remain high. Um, I haven't showed you evidence of this, but it's in a background paper. High skilled, sir, I, I believe that high-skilled services cannot at present be an engine of growth in Africa on a large scale because educational levels, if you look at the educational data, there's a, a new data set. Well, it's not brand new, but a data set that Barrow and Lee have, it's publicly available on the internet all the way up to 2010. Education levels in Africa are still extremely, extremely low. So the kinds of services African people, the majority of African workers can enter into at this point are not high, very high productivity, high paying kinds of jobs. Manufacturing has a lot of potential, but it's still lagging. And um, I just want to point you to, uh, to a paper that Jim Robinson recently wrote uh, on the possibility of using natural resources for industrialization. Um, it's hopeful and, um, it ex it in, and it looks at history, the Industrial Revolution in the UK, for example, and explains how it was that natural resources fostered industrialization. So there's a lot of potential. But there are, as, as, um, as we know, there are serious limitations to using macro data. So there are differences in the treatment of informality across countries. Uh, so Kenya is, is, is one example. If you look at the WDI or, or um, aggregate statistics for Kenya, um, you'll see that there's a teeny tiny share of the labor force in manufacturing. But if you know about the Juakali in, in Kenya, you know that, that there's something wrong with those statistics. And indeed, the government of Kenya separates out the formal sector from the informal sector. So if you just take one macro survey and look at those numbers, the results are very misleading. Then there are differences in the treatment of agriculture across countries, so even within, and within countries. So in Botswana, which has some of the best data in Africa, we found that they did the agricultural census in two different years in the labor force survey during two different time periods and didn't take that into account so that it shows a huge increase in the share of the labor force working in agriculture when the real reason for that is because one survey was taken during the lean season and one a survey was taken during the, the um, period during which more people are employed in agriculture. So there are problems with the, ma the macro data. And also there are limited shares, um, there's limited information on uh, employment shares. So um, even in the uh, world development indicators, there's hardly anything on the share of employment in, um, I think there are maybe six countries for Africa for which there exists data. So employment share, I mean, and that's even for three broad sectors. So if you want to get at a more detailed uh, analysis of employment shares, um, the data are lagging. I just wanted, uh, never mind. So, but even if national accounts data are perfect, the macro data ignore the following. So there's important within country heterogeneity, for example, across age groups, across gender, across education, and across geographic location. And the, the national income accounts only measure one standard of welfare, which is income or consumption, thanks. So what we're doing now, the most exciting part, and which I only have five minutes to tell you about, is using the demographic and health surveys to um, understand, to, to, to learn what we can based on those data about structural change in Africa. And um, one of the nicest things about the DHS data is if you look at Africa, uh, the, the darker the, the country, 
the more survey rounds we have. But almost all of Sub-Saharan Africa is covered at least once, and several countries are covered twice. Um, if, you, if you focus, so, so I'm just going to show you now some, um, the rest of the time I'm going to show you some summary statistics and some regressions that are more or less summary statistics based on these DHS data. So forget about the first set of bar graphs. Um, if you look at the second set of bar graphs, what we've done is we're looking at individual level data. So we have women and men, and they're asked um, about their sector of employment. They're asked whether they work seasonally. They're asked whether they've done this job in the past 12 months. Um, and so what you see between 93, 2004, and 2005 and 2011 is actually very consistent with what we found with the macro data. The share of the labor force um, in agriculture, if you include um, self-employed agriculture and an employee in agriculture, in other words, you, you merge the red and the yellow bars, you see that the share of employment in agriculture has fallen, but not dramatically. Um, one thing we have here is um, the share of people reporting that they're not working. It looks high, I know. We've excluded everybody enrolled in school. It's uh, people ages 15. Uh, to 59, and the share of the uh, labor force reporting that they're not working that's falling from 30 cent to 20, 30 percent to 26 percent, um, and the share of employees in skilled and unskilled manual labor has risen from 9 percent to about 11 percent. So these figures, on average, are very consistent with what we found with the macro data, but we have a lot more countries. So. For the, for the middle period, we have 45 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and for the last country period, we have 26 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if we look at um, what I'm going to show you now is um, just a, a couple of regressions really quickly. They're all the same. The only thing that's going to differ across these next five slides is the sample. So here's the full sample. It's more or less what we would expect. So if you don't have an education, you're more likely to work in agriculture. You're less likely to work in all these other professional sales and skilled uh, jobs. And you're more likely to be not working. Um, the youth, the big thing about youth is if you go to the last col column, youth are 13% more likely to report that they're not working. And that's not including people who are enrolled in school. And for a second time, we've excluded people who are enrolled in school. Uh, in urban areas, um, you're 35.9% much less likely to report that you're working in agriculture. All the numbers are consistent with, luckily, <laughs> they make sense. You know, we don't expect urban people to be as much engaged in agriculture as the rural. And, um, not working, you're 4% more likely to be not working if you're in the um, rural areas. And then for female, females are 16% less likely to be working in agriculture, 18.5% more likely to be not working. Finally, um, um, the, the last two rows are GDP per capita and the Polity 4 score, so a general measure of governance. In general, our general measure of governance has the right sign, but it's very small and sometimes insignificant. GDP per capita, on the other hand, has big effects. The, um, in general, GDP per capita leads to people reporting they're working more in every sector and they're less likely to be unemployed. Um, let me show you men and women. There are different, very, very different effects um, across males and females. So this is, this is actually really interesting here. Uh, and, and the reason I included GDP per capita in here, one of the reasons is because um, we want to talk about it. This is a, a conference about inclusive growth. So look at that. GDP per capita leads to uh, for, w increases in GDP per capita are li lead to 14.2% reduction in the probability that a woman is not working. So increases in growth lead to better, uh, not better, but more women working. Um, interestingly, it's the reverse for men. It's mostly, it's primarily an urban phenomenon and a, and a youth phenomenon. Because if you look at men who uh, are in rural areas, I'm done, I'm done. Uh, okay. I like the, <laughs> look at this, this GDP per capita has a much bigger effect in rural areas than in urban areas. Interesting. 
And, oh shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, that's it. So preliminary results from the DHS data, we obviously have a lot more work to do, but the broad pan patterns are consistent with the macro data. Women are much less likely to be, more likely to be unemployed and much less likely to be unemployed in agriculture. Growth it appears to be inclusive in so much as it has quantitatively larger effects on employment in rural areas, which is kind of interesting. And um, only caveat is, though, is that it could be increasing to rural urban migration. Um, Youth are much more likely to be unemployed and youth in urban areas, youth, you, female youth in urban areas are the worst. And we have a lot more to do. The next step is to um, look at, we want to look at health and education by sector so that we can get uh, some indicators of welfare by sector since we have all these different sectors. Um, so to, to, to look at you know, instead of looking at TFP, for example, by sector, we want to look at other indicators of well-being by sector to better interpret what the changes in employment across sectors means for Africa. Thank you very much.